for me. Uh, you heard that I was an adjunct for a number of years. I really enjoy being around students. Uh, one of my aspirations when I was an undergraduate was to pick up a PhD and teach. And uh, then you have a mortgage and a car payment, and a couple of kids come along. It's pretty difficult to get back into it. So, uh, loved my days here at Utah State. Uh, would have remained here and graduated here, except my girlfriend, now my wife, uh, got out of high school and went to Weber State. So I felt like I had to kind of go down there to protect my interests. So, uh, I'm working for 1-800-CONTACTS in Draper, Utah. We are a retailer through stores, web, and phone of contact lenses. We've also started within the past four months another online business called glasses.com. How many contact lens wearers do we have here? <laughs> okay. Uh, our company was founded uh, by Jonathan Kuhn, uh, who was a BYU graduate student living in the married dorms, contact lens wearer had to go in and have the exam. They may or may not have had trial lenses. You may have had to go back to get the trials. They may or may not have worked. And then once it was finally determined what was best fit for you, the manufacturer had to ship them out to the doctor and you went back. So Jonathan, being a great entrepreneur, said there's got to be a better way. He invested $50 in signs and plastered them across the BYU campus that said contact lenses delivered to your dorm. That uh, took off. It resonated. He then brought in a partner from uh, California who was in the contact lens business. They started selling out of a home, typical entrepreneurial startup. Um, Jonathan said, 1-800-CONTACTS, uh, 1-800-CONTACTS. I wonder who owns that phone number. Dialed it up. It was a live number, no voice recording. Um, he had uh, an ex-CIA guy go find out who owned it. It was a real estate guy in Atlanta who had purchased it. Jonathan offered him $50,000 for that number. Uh, he wanted $500,000 for the number, and I think they settled on $234,000. At the time, we had a couple of angel investors, and there was a huge debate as to spending that much money on a phone number. Well, Jonathan's vision was correct because once we turned it on live, anytime there was an advertisement on the radio or television for a contact lens from Vistacon, BNL, SEBA, Cooper Vision, our phone started to ring. So it was a, a wonderful investment. Uh, currently, our company employs over 900 associates, uh, all in Utah except for our founder who moved back to Texas. Um, we do about $765 million in revenue. Uh, we are in a joint venture with Walmart uh, where we do their contact lens business. We entered that agreement with Walmart uh, three and a half years ago. And at the time we entered into it, we see a normal progression from when people hear about us to call in initially from, from on the phone and then they migrate to the web. So when I started nearly seven years ago, 80% of our business was on the phone. Anybody want to speculate what percent of our business is on the web now? 70 plus percent. It's low touch, it's easy, we're just developing a mobile app, we're about a year slow on that, but for the smartphones, uh, and that will come up uh, here in the next couple of weeks. So I want to do two things. I think as I was a student and learning theoretical, I wanted to know a little bit more about practical, and I wanted to know about businesses, because it, it helps round out your education, your understanding, if you see what other people have actually done. So today, uh, I certainly want to answer questions and, and speak to topics that you all have interest in. But I'll start out a little bit with 1-800-CONTACTS. Uh, so. Uh, 
I've kind of given you that, so we'll move on quickly through these. Uh, that is actually a store in Orem where Jonathan went to get his contacts and developed the idea about an online or a phone business. Um, does anybody remember the company Lens Express? Oops, let's try to get this right here. There we go, here we go. If you don't remember Lens Express, you may remember their spokesperson, Wonder Woman. Now, I don't know if at your age you remember Wonder Woman. But uh, we acquired Lens Express, who was by far the largest uh, phone and web-based provider. In 1995, our revenue was $5 million. Theirs was 40 You'll see the progression here. And we acquired them in the year 2000. So we had grown dramatically where their business had really not taken off. The focus of our business has been the customer. The culture of the company is just phenomenal. It starts with each of the associates and the realization that you can't have a satisfied customer if you have an associate who is not happy in their job, who hasn't been well trained, who doesn't know what our values and our culture should be. One of the other things that made us successful, as I mentioned, obtaining some intellectual property. So we have obtained all kinds of different names that Jonathan had the vision to do that early on. Now, in creating this business, we had two problems. We had to satisfy and solve our supply problem uh, as well as our demand problem. Uh, back when this company started, you could not take your prescription from your doctor. Uh, the law allowed them not to give it. So when I started buying contacts years and years ago, instead of a $5 lens or less today, uh, they were approximately $100 to $150 each. Those were the old gas perms. And so we had to, one, get the major manufacturers to sell to us, and two, uh, we had to create an environment where we could successfully deal outside of the legislation or within the existing legislation and change it. So uh, the business back in that time was about 90% of the contact lenses were sold through individual doctors. We had to overcome that. Manufacturers were essentially in collusion on that point and refused to sell to us. So we could go out and, and did go out on the gray market, which was typically outside of the United States, buy the same exact lenses from someone that the manufacturers would sell to, bring them in and sell them for less money than the doctors were selling them for. Uh, each of the states then enacted legislation that effectively reduced competition. So we started a major effort at lobbying and legislative affairs where 32 states attorneys generals agreed with us and said this was restraint of trade. We then said, look, it's a lot of effort to go to every state. I think we were young enough and stupid enough to think that we could impact federal legislation. So that was the approach we took. We settled with all parties on the supply side. As a result of the legislation, uh, there was a mutual agreement. Uh, AOA is the American Optical Association. Uh, they were absolutely opposed to the release of the prescription. So we had to overcome that as well. So once the supply side was solved, we then had to focus on the demand side. Uh, this graphic shows the states where the doctors were by state law required to release your prescription and those where no release was required. We ran into resistance on the federal level 
where we showed that we, we took a test case in Texas and we said, okay, we will work with voluntary release from the doctor. So for a one year period of time, we lost about $5 million business in Texas because the doctors voluntarily would still not respond to our calls for prescriptions or verifications. Uh, there were 5,000 different complaints lodged with the, the Texas Optometry Board by patients who, would not, who could not get their script released by the doctor. Of those 5,000 complaints, do you want to take a guess on how many were investigated? Zero. So that took us into federal legislation. And hopefully this will come up. So, as I mentioned before, we then went to fight the law on a federal level. We had great support from Senator Bennett. We essentially wrote the law, presented it, testified in Congress before various hearings, and the Fairness Contact Lens Consumer Act was passed. The major provision of that, two major provisions, one, you've got to release the script to the patient, and two, what we call passive verification. So, now just because we have a script from a patient, if we have that, we can go ahead and ship. But one of our services is, tell us your doctor. And if they don't know who their doctor is, give us your address. So our database contains every doctor in the United States and North America. And we can then call the doctor and say, there's one I had her contacts, recalling on behalf of Pat Smith to verify her prescription. Here's the left eye, right eye, all of the parameters. And 
if they do not respond within eight business days, eight business hours, excuse me, eight business hours of their office, because we have every office hours, then we can presume it's verified. Uh, does anybody want to guess about what percentage of doctors respond to us today? <laughs> not very many, uh, unless it has expired. If it's an invalid script, they will uh, respond to us. We will get back in touch with our customer and one of the services we provide is to line them up with doctors. So we want the patient experience to be as seamless and as quick as possible uh, and as a result of this federal law we then created a business that we could work out through. And I'll skip through some of these other things. That's how long it took us to get this. Demand solved. Uh, this is the lobby of one of our main buildings in our campus. And here's kind of our driving values and principles. Uh, we have uh, about a six week training period for call center agents. Most companies have two weeks worth of training for call center agents. We train them not only in the law, but in the physics of contact lenses uh, and when people call in, we offer uh, various alternatives. We will sell uh, a year's supply at a very high discount because it's one touch for us. Uh, we will uh, provide free shipping and an absolute guarantee of return of any unused contacts. If you go have Lasix, if you get tired of wearing contacts. So our customers have been <coughs> phenomenally loyal to us. Now, I don't know if you've studied marketing on uh, customer retention. You've got a customer. What percentage of those customers come back a second time? Any guess on percent of our customers that come back to us? 80 to 90 percent of our customers are repeat customers. The other value that, that we teach every associate is this really simple formula, that satisfaction equals reality minus expectations. So we're trying to exceed customer expectations in every respect. Uh, we think it's easier to control uh, the customer by satisfying them completely than it is to try to go out and find additional new customers. We have about 14 million customers now. We're a 15-year-old company, uh, and our active customer base is close to 10 million, 10 million. Now, one of the customers, one of the questions that come up consistently is, well, don't you lose people because of LASIK? And the answer is yes. Some people are good, uh, pay, uh, fit, fit the profile for successful LASIK, some people do not. The improvement in the technique has been dramatic. When my own kids have asked, should I do LASIK? I says, I'm not a medical doctor, but I can give you my advice. Wait another two to three years because the improvements are phenomenal. Uh, but the coming into the category are people every year in larger numbers than we're losing patients to LASIK or non-contact lenses. What are our demographics? Our typical customer is 65% female. They're above average income. Uh, but more importantly than that, they are the determiners of purchases for contact lenses, buying either for the husband, the kids, uh, the whole family. So our advertising is typically aimed at that demographic. Now, we have some comp competition that's come on in the last six years where their pricing is slightly lower than ours. Or if you go to, for example, Costco or Sam's, one of the clubs, their pricing will be slightly lower. But we offer uh, wonderful, exceptional customer service uh, with very little effort on the part of the customer, and they just keep coming back to us. Has, it, has anybody here seen any of our advertising, 1-800-CONTACTS on television? 
Maybe not. Uh, these presentations are made for larger groups, so we won't go through every slide. Uh, we do have one problem out there in the industry. We have some of these online retailers that don't comply with the law. So we occasionally get calls from the FTC, Federal Trade Commission, uh, about a particular complaint. 99% of the time, they're not our customer. 1-800-CONTACTS uh, has such a brand name recognition, it's like Kleenex for tissue. And so uh, the assumption is, well, it must have been 1-800-CONTACTS. Uh, we record every phone call, outbound and inbound. We have every record from all the way back to 1994. Uh, so we can demonstrate that we have made the calls, that they have listened to the whole message to the doctor. Uh, and so we have a real competitive advantage in, in our brand and our concept is not easy to duplicate at all. If someone orders a contact lens at four o'clock in the afternoon and we have a valid script or we can get it verified, we can get it to you the next morning before noon. Uh, we ship uh, on average uh, about 65,000 orders a week. Uh, our peak has been over 100,000. So it is a highly automated process. We also have, again, intellectual property all around our name that uh, people can't duplicate or take. And we have several phone numbers. 1-800-COASTAL. Uh, Coastal Contacts is an online provider, but we, we bought the names. Uh, you'll see some of these other ones, iMasters, for example, that we have owned the, the property to for years and years. And we took that as a defensive strategy. So 1-800-LENSCRAFTERS, a big vision company, we own those. There's a, a brief shot of our website. We'll move through very quickly. Uh, we also have online kind of an educational tool for customers if they have any questions about anything to do with the eye. Uh, one of the reasons we're able to attract uh, agents is one, we don't do outbound calls, uh, no outbound sales. It's all inbound order fulfillment answering questions. Yes, we do offer uh, different discounts for volume. Uh, each of the agents have two flat screens. They have their own personal space. There's no hoteling. Uh, they personalize their, their cubes. They are larger cubes than is typical uh, in the industry. And flexibility is phenomenal. We have 170 different schedules. I remember as a young person applying for a job and they said, you know, you can work from 8 to noon or noon to 4 or 4 to midnight. Uh, the only thing we have available is 4 to midnight. So we have great flexibility with our student population. We, we probably have a little bit, about 40% of our associates are students. Uh, the remaining percentage is equally split between working moms and I'll say older people who just want some part-time work. We have approximately 170 agents at home. Uh, that's a, another distinct advantage and why we can keep and retain the best people. We also have uh, dashboards that show each agent's performance and goals and how the center is doing. Uh, we provide a base wage as well as sales incentives. Uh, the top 10% of our agents are making um, around 50000 or in excess of that. Typical agent will bonus out at about 2 to $3 an hour. It's because it's a relatively easy sale.
Uh, this is part of our training and feedback and communications process. Now, I, well, I've made this presentation before, and people are skeptical. When you call into a service center, what's the typical wait time that you experience? I know it depends on what it is, but typically you get an answer, a recorded message that says something like, uh, gee, your business is really important to us. Uh, your call may or may not be answered, uh, but your call's not really important enough for us to answer it right now. That's the implied message. We answer 90% of all calls within 10 seconds. Uh, our email response is approximately 10 minutes. We were making a presentation at, uh, similar to this at BYU. Uh, one of the students emailed, said, our, your CEOs make a presentation to me and claims that every call is answered typically within 10 minutes. Three minutes later, the agent responded, yes, that's correct, say hello to Jonathan for me. So. We also do a lot of personal cards. I was talking to the group earlier where each agent is authorized. You don't have to get it approved. They're empowered to correct errors. When we do make an error, it could be that we ship the wrong lens, which is uh, less than one one hundredth of a percent. Uh, or we were out of stock and we didn't inform the customer of the out of stock or we gave an incorrect date. So each agent can do five, ten, twenty-five dollar gift certificates and we've been known to in uh, areas where we think we really messed up, give a free year supply of contacts. Uh, if any of you have had marketing classes, I hope you have, you should be taking some marketing classes. You're going to find out that people that have a good experience might tell their friends. What happens if you have a bad experience? You definitely tell your friends. You definitely tell your friends and your family. So we measure... Uh, Net promoter scores constantly through our customers and internally with our associates. Uh, the, the RX or verification department does make the outbound calls when we don't have a valid prescription. We have 100 dedicated associates there. There is no incentive to ship for them because we don't want them to be just saying, yeah, it's a valid script. Go ahead and ship it. Uh, accuracy is above absolutely everything else we do. Our average order size you see here, this is about a year old, is $144 an, uh, an order. It's slightly above that now, it's about 151. All of our car calls are initially, uh, are initially, uh, or are initiated initially by a live agent. We are under the law able, once we get a live voice, then able to switch it to a recording that has all of the specifications for patient name and parameters. Uh, if they hang up on us and haven't heard the whole message, we then have to resend it. So we do get some complaints from doctor's offices saying, you just keep calling and calling. Well, listen to the whole message and either respond or if you don't, you, the calls will stop. Uh, I think you can appreciate that there is, between the American Optical Association and ourselves, not a lot of love lost because we have taken the business of contact lenses away from the doctors. They generate revenue through their patient exams or through selling of glasses or contacts. Uh, I, I am proud of what Jonathan has done in 1-800 because we have reduced the cost of contact lenses in this country substantially, probably over 50% in the last six to seven years. So our compliance to the law is phenomenal. We've been tested by multiple doctors, by subcommittees of Congress, by the FTC. We've had zero violations.
Oops, that's our distribution center. Uh, I mentioned earlier we ship out orders uh, without any signature required because you may not be home. You want it shipped to a business. Uh, and people have asked, well, don't some dishonest people take advantage? Yep, probably, but it's a very small percentage. We just automatically ship a second order, but it's shipped FedEx and signature required on the second attempt. Can really an active customers, we've talked about that. Verification. Now some people have asked, why Walmart? Why did we join uh, an alliance with Walmart? We're not a supplier, we're in a joint venture agreement. Uh, Walmart has brick and mortar, 1-800 does not. We are phone and web. Uh, they have doctors, we do not. Uh, that, that does hurt us at times when we don't have a doctor's network that we can immediately refer patients to. Uh, and Walmart has traffic. Of course, we offered a lot to uh, Walmart as well. 138 million people per week enter a Walmart. That's 85% of the American population. Walmart has only 10% or had when we entered in this agreement, only 10% of the contact lens market in the United States. When you go to their aisle that has all of their vision products, their market share is 30%. So our efforts have been to connect those people that are going to the vision aisle, which represents 70% of all contact lens wearers in the United States, to go back over to their vision centers. Uh, so once we've gone into the alliance, we now control between our phone and web and their stores about 24% of the contact lens business in the United States. So it's by far the largest player. We're gonna run out of time and I wanna take questions too, so I'll keep going. I show you that as one of our initial uh, television advertisements. We found that 15 and 30 second spots are a whole lot more effective for this product than, than longer ones. We've stayed relatively traditional except our latest campaign. Quite a different approach in the two ad campaigns, right? Okay, which approach do you all like? The humor approach or the straight approach? I'm going to cut that one off and that one. All right, I mentioned glasses.com. Um, 
here's kind of a mock-up of what the creative people do before they get into an ad campaign. And then it turns into, for our web page, the following. Uh, those of you that have spectacles, glasses, any of you pay $450 for a fashion frame and lenses? <laughs> Before insurance. It's not unusual at all. Uh, we have uh, negotiated with some of the prime people in terms of the fashion frame industry. For example, Oakley. Uh, I went in and checked. I've got my contacts on today. But uh, the Oakley frames I have and the lenses when I went to Lens Crafters were $525. We sell that same thing online for uh, $249. So our discounting is heavy. We are not the online player where you can go get a pair of glasses and lenses for $40. Uh, we offer mid to high end and more fashion because that fits the democratic demographics of our customer base. OK, enough about the company. What G? What can I speak to now? What would you like to know? <coughs> yes, sir. Career in HR. Uh, after my grad school, and I took a lot of graduate psychology, I went into pharmaceuticals. I've always been in the medical business, one version of it or another. Uh, I started as a production supervisor in a pharmaceutical facility, uh, went into uh, production inventory control. I was a purchasing manager. Uh, then I'd always had an interest in HR. And I worked for a, a CEO who at the time knew my interest there. I took a lot of graduate psychology, sociology classes. And uh, we had our, uh, back then it was called personnel, but our plant personnel manager had left for another job. Uh, at the tender age of 28, he gave me a wonderful opportunity to be a plant personnel manager. I was learning on the job. That was my first experience. Spent uh, many, several years there. Went back into operations as uh, uh, director of pharmaceutical operations. Uh, the company wasn't doing well, so I took over HR and operations. Uh, back into supply chain for a couple of years, then back into HR, and uh, been a director of HR, a VP of HR, uh, for the last 17 years. And I love it. I, I really enjoy supply chain. Great challenges there, but I really enjoy the challenge of, of helping solve problems uh, with people and in leadership. One of the, I think one of the most difficult things that you all will do in your careers will be to effectively lead people because they're not consistent. It's not like a chemical formula. And, and I dare say that there's not always a black and white answer. You know, there are various shades. That doesn't mean you don't have an ethical standard. You do. But it rarely comes down to that. So spent a, a lot of years in HR. Currently, my job, I'm responsible for, uh, and I joke about this, uh, all of the corporate functions, administrative functions that none of the other executives want. So I end up with them. But I have a director of HR reporting to me. I am responsible for real estate, uh, campus, community relations, public relations, uh, corporate contributions. Uh, facilities, security, environment, and I'm sure I'm missing a couple oh, food services and a few others. So, yes? Uh, tell us about how you go about uh, selecting someone to be the you know, Is there some kind of a uh, competency profile or model you're looking Entry for? level into the call center. Yes, we have a profile that we have developed, and it's not like other call centers. We would prefer not to have someone from another call center, although we don't exclude them, because we have found that we have to get them to unlearn certain practices they learned at other call centers because we are so customer-focused. 
So we will take people who demonstrate uh, a good voice on the phone. The first thing we do is a phone interview, a phone screen. Uh, people that have had some experience in dealing with people in a sales capacity or maybe it's a non-sales capacity. And then we do try to look for uh, uh, that, that focus, that, that kind of happiness about a person because we found that people that are happy tend to relate better on the phone with those that aren't. So it's a really simple profile. Our turnover in our call center, by the way, I don't know if you know anything about call centers, but annualized turnover in call centers with outbound sales calls, 150 to 200 percent turnover per year. That's phenomenal. Our turnover for our call center agents is 40 percent. To other non-outbound call centers, they're about. It depends on what the call center is. Uh, for example, at Comcast, if it's a technical call center. Their turnover is a little less, 25 to 30. Uh, if it's a non-technical call center in Utah, it's averaging between 60 and 80. It has gone down during the, the recession, uh, but we've seen it pick up in the last 12 months, too. Are you happy with the 40% or do you want to, I mean, is that a, is that a good long form now? Or? Uh, yes and no, and that's a really good question because our turnover occurs in the first six months. If you haven't ever been on the phone for a six-hour shift, some people are just not cut out for that. One of the things we do is we profile the job for the people before we make an offer. Now, you don't get a complete sense of it, but at least they know what they're getting themselves into. So if we have someone that makes it through the first four to six months, they're typically there until they graduate. Uh, until they find a job in their chosen occupational field, till they go on missions, till they relocate. So our turnover for people outside of the six-month category drops down to about 20%, which is highly unusual for a call center. And I, I really attribute it to the culture we've created and the way that we treat associates. Our associates are very happy people and enjoy being there. Yes, we get 80% of our applicants are referrals. We have won multiple awards, best of state, best work-life balance, year after year, best employer, uh, best heart healthy, best uh, wellness. I mean, it just goes on and on. Uh, and so we are an employer of choice. Uh, so out of the, let's say, 500 a month, we will hire about 20 if we're in a big push, because there is a little seasonality to contact lenses. During the good weather months, people buy them more, and during the holidays, they shop for other things. So January, we get slammed with orders as well. Yes, sir? Um, how do you measure employee performance? You said you have a nice little chart and stuff on the screen. How mm -hmm. is that measured? We, our biggest measurement is quality, because we're a service provider. Uh, and that quality is measured by, we have a yardstick of things that they should do during that call. We have a quality department that then listens to five to ten calls per month. Uh, and that's outside of the call center of their manager listening to calls. And those calls are then graded and it comes up to a grade. Uh, and then the associate, if they disagree, there's a way to appeal that. And it's heard by a panel of three other managers. That's one, our primary one. We measure revenue per call, uh, availability, uh, closing ratio. If you get 100 calls and, and you uh, answer or you get 30 orders of that, that would be poor by our standards because our closing ratio is phenomenal. It's nearly 50%. And a lot of that is because we have repeat customers that know us and just want to place the order. I'm going to apologize. I promised Max that we would get him out of here on time. So maybe one last question and then we can. Yeah. Well, it's kind of a two part question. First, um, you said you had about 900 employees. Yes. 400 that were call center associates. Correct. Are the other 500 and more in like shipping or? Uh, we've got 100 in verification. Uh, we've got 90 in our distribution and shipping. We have a very large IT function, uh, 90 people that have 
given us the ability to do all these service levels that we are. Uh, I've got about, now this is overlapping, but of the group of 900, we have 200 salaried professional associates. Uh, we have a typical, well, for a company our size, I have five attorneys on staff, and that's phenomenal because we had to fight to create an environment, a legal environment, where we could succeed. And then and, from that, what kind of career development do you think? Career development, uh, good question. Uh, our students, unfortunately, that get their degrees, we're not able to offer them all professional positions. But of that group of about 200 people, uh, I would say we have well over 100 that came up through the ranks that are now directors, associate directors. Some have you know, moved into marketing, IT, got technical degrees, uh, a large finance department, HR is about 16 people. So we, we have a lot of people that are focused on our associates and lots of opportunities. One other question? Thought I saw another hand there. If, you, if you're willing to take another question, what are, you mentioned uh, that you give bonuses out uh, depending on what their sales levels are. Yeah. Are there other uh, incentives that you Recognition offer? Recognition and incentives? Yes. Uh, we have cash incentives on your anniversary that are typically $300 to $3,000 each time you hit a level. So substantial. We have birthday recognitions. We have individual spot recognitions. Uh, awards. Uh, a bonus by definition is if you do A, you will get paid B. A reward is there's no precondition. We just recognize something you've done and make a payment for that. So those are occurring frequently. So maybe just... Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, it's... If, if you haven't been there, it's hard to understand this, but we have a uh, nationally recognized restaurant. It's not a cafeteria. We have eight to 10 entrees per day that range from fresh fish to steak to all the specialties. The most you can pay for any entree is $2 or $2.50. All of the breads, cereals, juices, drinks are free. Uh, we offer, I mean, it's not cheap. We do the Starbucks coffee and, and any milks, anything you want. So we do have students that have the ability to have three meals a day there for nothing. It's 92% subsidized by the company, and then we pay the tax equivalent of the value of that meal for the associate. Our wellness center is manned by personal assistants, uh, and it's the restaurant, the wellness center are all open to associates and their families, no charge. We have phenomenal employee activities. It's kind of a young, hip culture where they started what they, what's the vampire series? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and each of those events cost us about $65,000 that we do three times a year. And we put on an event for the family during the summer with entertainment and it's phenomenal. It costs over 200000 So. I just give you some figures to show you there's a real commitment to spend for the associates, which makes our job in HR in terms of recruiting really easy because it comes from employee referrals. Uh, just one last closing comment for those of you that have careers, whether it's in HR or in other leadership positions, our philosophy that we've developed is that HR is not the policeman. We are absolutely not there to play policeman. We are there. Uh, to make the line organizations more effective and efficient, to do for those things that will help them focus on the customer. Um, we have, we joke, we have a good sense of humor with ourselves and with our internal clients, but we joke about leaders will come in with the dumb idea of the month or the week. They're smart people, they have a real problem, and our job is to define a more socially, morally, ethically acceptable solution to that. I exaggerate by saying, you know, somebody has come in and said, my, my call center agents that are over 50 just aren't as productive. I'm going to fire all the agents over 50. Well, why? You know, instead of saying, that's the dumbest idea I've heard all month. <laughs> why? Well, the fact is that you young people are much 
more savvy navigating the web and are more life experienced, I'm there, life experienced older workers take a little more time, but we've developed training methods to help them get through. A young person in a six week training, may, self paced, may get through in two weeks. But we then work with the other ones and they become very, very good agents. So we treat people with courtesy, dignity, respect. I mean, you hear companies say this all the time, but in my experience, they don't always live up to that. And we hold people accountable. That's the key. And holding people accountable doesn't mean you have to scream, yell, berate, belittle in any means. It's like an accounting model. You plan this, you measure it, you got this, you do a variance analysis. Why? You ask the simple question, why? And many times you plan this, they did this, it's great, why? So I think to be successful in leadership or to be successful, especially in HR, you gotta get your values straight, you gotta define how you're gonna treat people. Okay? Thank you. Um, Max, you have a gift of appreciation oh. and an official John M. Huntsman had folio Thank for Thank you, you very much. You are welcome. Thank you again for your time. We appreciate you coming all the way up great. here. Great, thank you.